Okay, so it is the end of 2023. I'm not sure whether to do a happy dance or have a giant shot of vodka, Um, (laughs) but we have made it to the end of the year. Uh, it being December or end of December 2023. So uh, we thought what better way to uh, celebrate and explore the year by doing a best of highlights of our podcast uh, for 2023. Yeah, and I thought there'd be some really good nuggets in there for buyers and sellers and some of our colleagues out there too. You might get some nuggets and takeaways to take you into 2024 and kickstart it off on the right foot. For sure. And, you know, as we look back at the year that was 2023, there certainly was a lot of fear and uncertainty, a lot of negativity in the media, especially in our industry and in real estate and amongst realtors and buyers and sellers and would be buyers and sellers and investors. So lots and lots of conversations um, and everybody was continuously trying to evaluate and then reevaluate literally five times a day. So (laughs) lots to um, think about as we enter into 2024. And this is just such a great way to recap that. I definitely think this is the year of working the most collaboratively with clients ever, ever before. So we are constantly problem solving, communicating, talking, thinking about pros, cons, pivoting, timing, you know, expectations, transparency. I made a lot of hard conversations over the last year, but We've been so fortunate to work with so many great buyers and sellers and renters and investors and basically see everybody through to a winning year. So there was a lot of opportunity. It just took a lot more grit and a lot more grind and a lot more time. And I think going back to the word collaboratively, a lot more partners involved, a lot more conversations with mortgage brokers, uh, real estate lawyers, divorce lawyers, estate litigation lawyers. uh, The list goes on and on of multiple parties involved in transactions, more than we've ever certainly seen before. And I think that goes to um, really speak to what we've seen this year with a lot of people under a lot of duress emotionally and financially. And I think that was working its way through the real estate market just as much as we're seeing it anywhere else. For sure. And I think one of the things that we really took away from this year though it being challenging for everybody for so many different reasons, is that staying mentally strong and as positive as possible and bringing and leveling up every day with our all-in attitude was really the only way that we could experience the market the way that we experienced it and then be there for our clients and be super present with them as well. And so I think it took a lot of tenacious energy and a drive and a motivation and a dedication that we've never even had to dig that deep before. And we have dug deep in the past. And I think we went to another level. So we're really looking forward to you reviewing our highlights. Again, if you have questions or comments or anything constructive about the feedback that we've shared with you over this last year, we would love, love, love to hear from you. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment down below. Ralph, do you want to have any uh, sign off for the end of the year? Yeah. Thank you so much for following us year one on our Fox Marin podcast. YouTube journey. We've got some really big things in store uh, next year as we start to get our sea legs underneath us with lots of great content uh, coming up. And just, you know, I just hope everybody has a safe and happy holidays and enjoy some of our highlight reel. Happy New Year, everyone. There's still a, some bullishness uh, on the future of the new condo market, but but pricing got a little inflated in, in relation to to the resale market, where you guys do a lot of your a lot of your work when when investors starting to look at the value gap between a new and, and resale condominium, and that you know had typically been fifteen to twenty percent, uh, started to get up to thirty five and forty percent. So there was some some real you know, trepidation or, or, or nervousness or whatever the word you want to, want to, want to use about that gap. Um, and so there was a, uh, a, a, you know, it's been a slowdown in the, in the new condo, condominium market uh, on the, on the rental side, obviously a lot of people that would have been buying new condominiums or would have been buying resale condominiums are saying, we're going to forego that because one, we just can't afford it Two, you know, that they, they're just, 
nervous about the market. Whenever, whenever you see pricing either stagnant or going down, it discourages people from buying. Uh, they don't want to put in, they may only have 5% to put down and they don't want to see that 5% uh, erased, you know, on paper within, you know, uh, uh, three to four months, right? So even though they may have no intention to sell in the future, but obviously they can't always control their, their employment situation. So, so the rental market has been red hot, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's calmed down a little bit in the second half or not the second half, at least the list last four or five months. Uh, but for a while there, we were seeing rent increases of, of 20, 30, and even 35% in certain neighborhoods of Toronto. So just unbelievable growth. And eventually there'll be some arbitrage, right? As, as rental rates, um, start to get so high that it makes sense again for, uh, people to buy. So, so I think there's a, there's a lot of people with much higher mortgage mortgages than they anticipated and, and they're, they're nervous about it. So, and I think, uh, you know, from, again, going back to my new home perspective, developers are the same way. There's a lot of developers that just feel like the, the rates are too high. Demand is not there. The rates they're going to pay on a construction loan are too high and it makes them feel a little bit nervous. So they're holding back launches and, uh, and it's, it's in the long run, it's, it's bad for our marketplace because we're not going to get the level of supply to, uh, to 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 service the demand. But we'll, it really just means that prices are going to eventually go back up because we're not going to deliver the amount of supply. But in the in the new condo market, it's quite a long cycle, obviously, between uh, a lack of launches in 2023 and then you know a lack of completions and a lack of supply in uh, you know maybe 2026 or 2027. So it's hard for someone making a a, a resale purchase today to say, okay, there's definitely going to be a major lack of supply in 2027. And how does that impact their, uh, their decision? But, uh, um, you know, I think e- each individual person has got to look at their own financial situation and, and, uh, and try to make that, uh, try to make that choice. You really don't want to sell into a depressed marketplace, but if you're looking to buy, I mean, that's the time to buy, right. Is to, is to buy low, but I understand how difficult it is to make that decision for, for people who've never bought a home before. I've always been under the impression that the rental market heats up during times of economic uncertainty. So I'm a little bit confused and perhaps our audience is too. I think everybody is confused right now because what we're seeing is something that nobody's seen before, which is an unprecedented increase in interest rates in the face of inflation. And so there are not many people in our line of work. There are not many landlords. There are not many first-time buyers who've ever seen this before. So it is very confusing because it's truly unprecedented in terms of what we're seeing on the ground. And I think that's having a a huge effect on the market. And essentially, my take on it right now is that the Bank of Canada has basically locked everybody into their homes. And because of that, it's really put a freeze on transactions. We've seen transactions at 20, 30, 40 year lows, even though we've seen the population of the city, you know, double or quadruple in that period of time. So um, we've seen a tremendous amount of slowdown. Uh, and it is surprising to see how slow the rental market has gotten as well. And I think we're seeing that slowdown happen in real time. And I don't think you're seeing the media uh, pick up on it yet, but we're definitely seeing it with all of our listings, with all of our interactions uh, with landlords and, uh, and tenants as well. So it is definitely happening in tandem currently with the resale market. Jerome and Ruben, could you add some extra light on that? Because you're closer to that vertical of the business. When did this, this, I was under the impression that the rental market was on fire and we were seeing unprecedented rental rates and properties renting out at a, such a quick velocity. And now I'm hearing that perhaps that's wrong and that we actually have rental products sitting. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, the data shows, at least in the city of Toronto, average condos slowed down for rentals uh, in the month of September. Generally, August is a huge month, usually the most popular month for tenants to move. It's the start of a new school year for university students. It's the start of a new school year for people with uh, children. And generally, it's the end of the summer. People are ready to get back to work, start their new lives wherever they make their new home. Now, in September, 
we track something called the absorption rate in the rental market. And absorption rate in September was the lowest it's been in 10 years outside of the one year in COVID. So what that means is effectively, uh, condos are taking almost twice as long to lease in the month of September as they were in August. And anecdotally, and with the little bit of data we have so far for October, that trend's continuing. And we're seeing average condos in the market for about 20 days right now in the month of October. If you uh, go back in time to when the rental market was quote unquote ripping, um, we we're seeing properties get leased within hours sometimes. Um, and I think average days on market at the peak of sort of rental mania was about seven or eight days. So what's causing the slowdown? I have a theory that Ruben, I think, agrees with. I think um, a, a large component of it is you know, prices around resale properties uh, are a lot more impacted by interest rates than rentals. Mm-hmm. Rentals are driven by people's income and people's job stability. So if somebody um, makes $65,000 a year, on paper, all they can really afford to pay is about $2,600 a month in rent to make the numbers make sense. And if you don't have wage increases going up, and keeping pace with the rental market, you're going to see um, the desire for tenants to move slow down. Second, and just as impactful to this, is that when you have sort of 20 to 30 uh, percent increase in average rents over a one and a half year period, like we've seen over the last year and a half, basically since January 2022, when the rental market started to return to normal after COVID, um, people are just locking in their rents. They're saying, if I move from my property, I'm going to have to pay one and a half times more for the same place. Why would I ever move? Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into some, you know, shared apartment data later in the conversation. But uh, that is, those are the two main drivers to get to where we are today. Who in the buyer's market has the biggest strategic advantage right now? I actually just had this conversation with somebody literally right before we jumped oh, on. Oh, really? Podcast. Yeah. And they were um, looking at uh, investing in a pre-construction project and they started to get a little bit hesitant about moving forward given their situation. And their situation was they have a fair amount of cash put aside and they are currently renting. And so we had a good long conversation about their situation and I was just like, you have the ultimate position right now. This is the ultimate buyer. She does not have to sell before she buys. Mm -hmm. So she's no concern there. And she has a significant deposit so that she becomes virtually unaffected by interest rates. Like that is the ultimate position. And I was like, well, you know, taking all this into consideration, your first priority should definitely be to buy something at resale over the next three to six months for sure. So the ultimate advantage, if you're in the position where you don't have to sell and you can just buy and you have a large deposit, I mean, that is the, you are the alpha predator of the Toronto real estate market. Um, But I'd say the secondary level would be if you just didn't have to sell and even if you had a strong, uh, you know, covenant and 20% deposit, you're still very well positioned and certainly much better than the people who are caught in a buy-sell scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I keep telling everyone the best position you can be in is to be a buyer with nothing to sell. And the second best position you could be in is to be somebody who doesn't need to do anything at all right now. I think it would be really hard to be a downsizer right now. Like, I think you could crush it on your purchase and buy an, an awesome condo or a smaller house or a smaller footprint but selling like a big mega kind of estate or a big family home that you've been living in for 20, 30 years that needs a mega renovation and to get this, you know, because that's your retirement nugget. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Usually usually a lot of downsizers own their their homes outright. Mm -hmm. They're from a different generation than our debt-ridden, easy money, Uber Eats, Netflix. No, chill. that's true, but they're not yeah. going to be unless they don't need to sell and they can pull equity. Then they buy exactly. Yeah, they exactly. If they if they can buy without having to sell, then they can position themselves in a really good spot a year or eighteen months or even two yeah, years down. That's the. I think that would be the only but, only way. But again, they're, they're downsizers positioning themselves where they can buy without selling. Yes, and then I think the upsizer is the one that's probably the most challenging of the three. 
between the first time home buyer that doesn't have to sell anything, the downsizer that possibly could pull equity as we just talked about, and then the upsizer, that's a challenging one where you have to sell your condo to be able to buy a low rise or you have to sell your first freehold townhouse to be able to move up the property ladder. Like that's a difficult move to make. The question is now, given where we are at today, what does that mean for the future? So one of the good ways to try and predict what may happen in the future is to look back at historical trends to similar type situations. And there was a really good graph that was put out by uh, David Rubenstein, economist, which I thought was really interesting. And it basically falls in line with the narrative that at minimum, it takes 12 to 18 months before we even start to see the effects of interest rate hikes take effect in an economy. So we're going to pull up this chart, which we uh, repurposed here to make it a little more clearer. But basically, this goes back to 1969 tracking, or 1968 actually, tracking every major recession since that point in time. And what this graph or chart shows is how long it takes from the time of the first rate increase for a recession to actually take hold when we do have a recession. And what it found was the average 22 months. Now, this report or came out in August. So we're at about 18 months now. So we're starting to get to a point now where the effect of all of these interest rate increases is going to start to take hold. And as this chart here uh, shows, is, is that we're starting to enter into that mark of 22 months. And we are, based on GDP, starting to see a slowdown in the economy. And it's really important that we also take into account that most recessions are also caused by when the Federal Bank or Bank of Canada over tightens and pushes us into a recession. And if they over tighten too much, they could put us potentially into a very deep recession. That's why I really feel that they should be very cautious with how they proceed at this point, because I think the last two increases in June and July could be very close to having pushed us over the edge and far too uh, ahead of our skis here. Interest rates are not going to go up to 15%, and the housing market in Toronto is not going to crash by 45%. So if you're watching this, deal with it. So now that we've put that aside, the reality is, is that we're in a very interesting time in the market right now, which is caused by interest rates being where they are at, which is a very, 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 very steep increase or incline in a very short period of time. The market, while soft, is stable. And there's a lot of people that think that, from economists to banks, that think that we are at the end of the rate cycle and rates are going to start to come down sooner rather than later. So understanding that we are in a rate-driven environment and understanding that the consensus is, for a whole bunch of reasons, that we're at the end of it, the question really is, is, how long is this window going to last until we start to see things uh, return to more normal levels in the way in which the Toronto real estate market operates in? And a lot of these advantages that we've discussed that buyers have will start to disappear or get taken away one by one by one. So I'm going to open this up to both Ian and Jess, whoever wants to go first, feel free. But what do you guys think, what do you see in terms of this window that we're in and how long uh, you guys think it will last? I always look to history as a guide. And like I said earlier in the podcast, what we are seeing and hearing in terms of the overall market climate right now is not dissimilar to Q4 of 2022 and even 2021 and 2020. And in December of the end of all of those years, the overall feeling was that things were going to continue to dip or stay pretty dormant and quiet. And then as soon as we got into February, it seemed like that herd mentality 
was, oh, there's all of these deals to be had because the stats on December are always published in January. And then everyone thinks that they're going to be the first brilliant mind to come to the table and take advantage of these low prices. And then everyone's competing again. I think that there's a good chance that will happen. But if interest rates come down, I think we're pretty much guaranteed to see a a boost in activity and prices climbing exponentially because of just how much pent up demand there is and how little supply we continue to have as a city. My estimate on this is that uh, the fall market of 2024 will be probably the first market to see a possible decrease in the rates. But if for any reason one of them happens and it happens to coincide with the spring market, wow, I can only imagine what will happen in April and May if there is actually one decrease before then. I don't think that's likely to happen, but if it does, that would that would kind of start a, a big reaction. But I do think, yeah, end of 2024, beginning of 2025, this window of opportunity will be closing. I think I'm in between Jess and Ian, actually. So I think we just need to see a, mo- a slight movement with the interest rates coming down. I think the possibility of that will be Q2 of next year. As soon as we see a t- tiny movement down, like just a little notch in the belt, that will be enough psychology shift for buyers to start moving into the market and move in fast. And we all know that Toronto buyers work on a FOMO mentality. And once one person goes, yeah. the herd will follow. And then it just takes that one, that just that one little flourish to happen. And then I think we will be back almost at the same pace by like over the summer, for sure. I think this, this little window buyers, you don't really have that much time no. left. The clock is ticking yes. and you have the end to the end of this year for sure Q1 next year. And then at that point in time, I think that's when things can start slipping from your fingertips. I want to be a reasonable, reasonable, fair sound voice here. And that's what our organization represents. We're not anti-cycling and I think that unfortunately, there's an awful lot of back scratching going on back and forth between the transportation department, between Cycle TO, and members of the public who have companies who are benefiting from the hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars every year being spent in building out the infrastructure. Who's paying for all of this? The city of Toronto isn't putting it up, it's being subcontracted out to. But all these companies that are winning lucrative contracts are giving money back. And, and so, it's, it's not fair what's happening. And this is the only way it's been able to happen is because I think that essentially uh, Transport Toronto, Transportation Toronto that's rolling these out have been hijacked and they're not representing the general public's viewpoint on it. And so it's sad because when it's all said and done in three years from now, we will have spent $150 million plus dollars building out infrastructure that could have gone to a second Cam H in downtown Toronto. It pains me when I walk to the parking lot where I have my car, that it pays me to see a homeless person addicted to street drugs, living in a bus shelter, when that money that we're spending on bike lanes should be spent on helping people like that. It should be spent on infrastructure for policing, to protect people who are going on our subway system so that they get, a number of people I talk to who are afraid to have their kids travel on the subways and on public transit for fear something's going to happen. I have countless stories of people who've encountered our public transit system, uh, which, by the way, is shouldn't be called the TTC. It should be called the TT3 because they no longer police collecting fares. They, they, you can walk in and out of them. I see people doing it all the time when I'm traveling on the subway. They have the little thing open so that they don't even track fares. They're not allowed to track fares being collected anymore. So we have a public transit system that's now become... A, a, a warm place for homeless people to sit on all day long. And it's a poor use of tax dollars that could be so much better spent on things that have so much more meaningful impact to make this the best city possible. Another thing we haven't touched on, guys, mm-hmm. and that is the infrastructure for ambulances and fire trucks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, there's I'm a, sorry. There's a, there's a video you have I saw on your website where it's showing uh, a fire truck unable to get through because of all the congestion on Young Street and like everything is just shut down and like one bike goes by on the five minutes that everything was shut down. 
Yeah, I mean, that's Young Street. It's the TTC. So when the TTC goes down and we have to start running buses to get people from downtown back and forth up to North York and through you know, the rest of the city, we are now, all of those buses, all of those cars are sharing one northbound and one southbound lane from Davisville up to, um, so Davisville sees me down to Bloor. And so look at, like, the, I, I had a lady call me up, burst into tears. She said, my son has a peanut allergy. Okay, I live on a street in Summer Hill called Walker Avenue. Uh, she said, if my son were to have a, an allergic reaction and if his throat were to close in and it happens during rush hour, like it's a life or death consequence. Okay, and so uh, she's like, oh, my husband and I are actively considering selling. Who knows? Maybe they'll become a customer of yours if they haven't been already. But the point I'm making to you in a, in a lighthearted way on that comment, but the point I make to you guys is that like there are very real consequences to the fact that our, our, our EMS vehicles, our fire vehicles can't get out there. And the leadership in those departments are not allowed to speak publicly about the problems. On Young Street, I spoke with members of the fire department and the, the data they collected, they ran around saying, oh, well, it's only made transportation, uh, it's only slowed down your, your typical commute up and down Young Street by 70 seconds or 80 seconds. Well, what they didn't tell you is that they, the, 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 the geographic footprint that they used wasn't Young Street. They included in that geographic footprint, they broadened it out, they included on the east uh, Mount Pleasant, and on the west, they included Avenue Road. So by give, putting a much bigger denominator, by putting a much larger catchment area, then, of course, it reduces the delays. And by the way, if we really want to be fair here, we should really just be looking at the delays between 7 in the morning and, let's say, 7 at night. Because really, realistically, when there are people on the roads at 3 in the morning, that data shouldn't be part of your 72nd a speaking point on how it's not affecting traffic. And so, again, another example of data manipulation, uh, but this is the consequences are much greater. There are eight or 9,000 people that are landlocked on Young Street between um, St. Clair down to, um, down to Rosedale Subway Station, seven or 8,000 people that have to come in and out of Young Street to get to the side streets that are dead-ended. Yep. And so, it's unfortunate because I, I just would have thought the city of Toronto was more professional. I would have thought that they, that we live in a democracy, that the data they use, that there would be some shame there to be fair and balanced in the way they were rolling out public policy. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that there's a, that it's been hijacked by a group of people that are a bit too fanatical uh, uh, and it's going to take the public. And I challenge people, if you're upset about bike lanes, mark your calendars, put a reminder on your iPhone today, October 26th of 2026, you better get out there and vote and you better get to keep Toronto Moving's website and look at what we're doing. And, and, and because look, at it's up to everybody to be engaged here. This, the, re, the way this all happened was that people were complacent. They didn't get out. They didn't, they didn't get involved. And now you have a reason that you need to get out and get involved. Apathy, eh, this is what happens when people are apathetic. How are we advising our clients in these moments right now? So we've had actually last week, I think we had three or four calls like this, where we actually turned down the opportunity to list a property for these reasons, because it was in the best interest for the seller not to list. Ralph, did you want to add any color to that? If you're thinking of selling right now, you need to ask yourself deeply, why? Is it out of fear? Is it because you're stressed on finances? Is it because you think the market really hasn't changed that much and there won't be that min that much of an issue to do what has always been something that was considered to be very easy by Toronto standards? And so it's just a very interesting time in that there's so much negativity, there's so much fear, there's so much uncertainty. But I think if you just take a step back and you just remind yourself that the fundamentals that have driven the Toronto real estate market have not changed. Supply, demand, failure in government, government policies, the green belt, like all of the challenges that we have, they are still there. 
And so what's really driving the issue right now is interest rates. And if you look at what all the big banks are saying, they're projecting that interest rates should start to come down by mid-2024. It's hard to know exactly when that will happen. But we saw last year in January when the Bank of Canada just came out and said, that's it, we're pausing. The market just shot back up. They didn't even do anything. They just changed sentiment by giving certainty. And so while there aren't a lot of active buyers out there, there are a lot of people who would love to buy right now just for various reasons, either financial or fear or whatever it is. They're choosing to sit on the sidelines. And there will come a time where this sentiment will shift based on what comes out of the Bank of Canada. And when that happens, the market will shoot right back up. And is it three months? Is it six months? Is it a year? It's really difficult for anybody to say. But what we're telling all of our clients is, is hang on, because when that moment comes, you want to be listing your property at that time. And the spread, the delta, could be literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is even if you can sell in this environment. And so we're really telling all of our people who need to sell or are considering selling to really take a good hard look at why, because you don't want to put your property on the market and three months later, the bank pauses or reduces rates. And then all of a sudden, you're out a couple hundred thousand dollars because you didn't have the patience (laughs) to see all of this through. Hang on is what we're telling all of our clients. And when you get on the other side of this, there will be a really good return for those who are patient and understanding what the fundamentals that are driving all of this are now and three to five years from now. You know, and I totally agree with everything, obviously. But obviously. I, obviously. I want to add one more thing that I think is interesting about the conversations that we had last week is that most of the sellers that we spoke to probably are in their second or third home and looking to make a move. And what they're seeing is opportunity on the buy side to upgrade to something bigger and better. So they're like, okay, I this is a great time to be a buyer because there isn't as much competition. There's more inventory out there than ever before. I might be able to scoop up a deal, whatever that means in Toronto. And they're like, this is my opportunity to make that move. But for me to make that move, I have to sell first. So what do you think? And we're like, yeah, it sounds like a great time to buy, but we cannot guarantee your sale. So this is the, these are the exact conversations we're having. And it's we've always notoriously told our clients generally, and there have been a few exceptions like COVID and some other random things like global pandemics that we've had to deal with. Besides those things, most of the time, we've always encouraged our clients that you need to buy first before you sell because the buy side has been the challenging side because of competition, because of bully offers because of people overpaying and all the reasons we've talked about on former podcasts. And then we're like, buy first, try to get a longer closing date and we'll sell after because the sale is going to be super easy. Mm -hmm. Now we're like, no, 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 no. (laughs) What you need to do is you need to sell first if you can, get a decent price if you can, and then go off shopping after that. Like we've just totally reverse engineered what we always do, Mm -hmm. right? 100%. The ultimate strategy, and we've worked with several clients recently to bring this into play, is if you can take your property, rent it out, pull out equity, or just rent it out, straight rent it out, and purchase a property and wait to a better environment to sell your property, but taking advantage as a buyer in a buyer's market of acquiring a property. And when when the tide comes back up, you'll have more equity in your principal, you'll have be able to refinance at a lower rate, and you'll have your former principal, which is now an investment property, and you'll be able to sell that at a much higher price while currently having somebody there, either paying your costs or certainly paying a significant amount of your costs. And that is, if it's possible to do, because not everybody can do that, But that is the winning strategy in a market like this if you're looking to make a move. And our overall arching thesis right now at Fox Marin is is that it's going to get a lot worse on the short term, 
before it gets better. And so if you're in this environment right now and you own a property, it's one of the things we've been telling all of our clients and everyone we've been consulting with, if you don't absolutely have to sell, hang on, hold on for dear life, because in a year from now, uh, we could be in a very different environment. If you are a buyer, and you're going to see some generational opportunities uh, in the next few months. So if you're on the sidelines looking at getting in, I think you're going to start to see some great opportunities coming down the pipes, especially on the condo side. But I think if you can nail down and be specific on the low rise for what you're looking for, you will definitely find some opportunities. And the most important person right now or buyer in the market is a buyer who does not have to sell, who can purchase without selling, and has a a large deposit uh, or a large amount to put down. So they aren't feeling the brunt of interest rates, and then they can refinance at a later date when rates do come down. So if you're a buyer or an investor and you don't have to sell and you've got a lot of cash at hand, you essentially are the apex predator of the Toronto real estate market. But when you actually take a look at the current situation, even though there is a lot of inventory on the market and there is continued pressure on pricing and opportunities for buyers that they normally wouldn't have to negotiate or add in conditions, we're still not seeing affordability in the market. So yes, there will be short-term reductions in pricing, but you're not really seeing carrying costs really drop in lieu of that because interest rates are so high. So we're still having a tremendous lack of affordability and the carrying costs, even though you're purchasing at a lower price, may not really reflect the advantage of purchasing at a lower price point right now. So that is something to really keep in mind. And I think it's really important to understand is that the drop in activity that we're seeing is really just a cyclical reaction to what happened as a result of government stimulus and money monetary printing during uh, COVID. And this is really the end of a cycle that we're starting to see or get to move towards, it has nothing to do with an actual fundamental weakness uh, in the Toronto real estate market. Okay, so there you have it. That was the highlight reel of the best of 2023 of the Fox Marin Toronto Real Estate Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed putting out this awesome content this year. We're certainly looking forward to what the future holds in 2024. And we hope that whoever is watching and has made it to the end, that they've really enjoyed our content. And we look forward to seeing and hearing from everybody uh, next year. Contact us anytime. We're super nice. Thank you so much for all for tuning in. We will see you in the new year. Happy holidays.